she invited me to help her curate a show at Super Collider, which mm-hmm. is the one you saw. It was called Artifacts of Sentience. And that was thinking about the internet being the last generation of people who will parent, who remember the world before the internet, presumably, unless really all hell breaks loose and we lose it. Um, Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I see where Javier is going. Uh, so um, we were really cognizant of this as the lockdown period began. And it's just, I feel, you know, there, there's a very significant and very powerful and very, very tiny group of people who control computer code and develop an artificial intelligence and are basically making our future and we're all going along with it. And it's a really small, demographically select group of people. So um, there's, I don't think there's nearly enough attention paid or criticism of it. And we, uh, we were just thinking about the internet and effect on the culture and that, you know, as women parenting and the kids have just access to the internet and instant information and all these things that were just really, really different than my childhood. And we um, worked on creating a show of artists who were investigating different elements of our online culture. I mean, I actually think in like these really, really, really super big picture things that we have to think about what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. If AI develops a sentience, develops a consciousness, which is like, you know, a cyberpunk idea, it's existed for a while. Where will humans be? What will we be? And what are our physical bodies? And I think because the physical body gives us lots of pleasure, but it also gives us lots of pain. It mm-hmm. gives us so much trouble. It's part of why we're, I mean, people are very invested in their internet identities. Yeah. Because they can make them more beautiful, like the way that, you know, you Photoshop, I don't do this, but like people Photoshop a selfie or whatever with a face tune and all that. You could do all these things that you don't actually have in real life. And people get more and more invested in that. And I actually don't think it's healthy. I think I work in the internet and I I don't see the internet. I think the internet is an amazing communication device, an amazing organization device that can be really helpful. But the way that people have started to interact online, it, it seems to have a lot of ramifications that are not so healthy. So yeah, I find that I just it's fascinating. And I don't know what will happen. <laughs> Welcome to What's My Thesis. I'm your host, Javier Peranza. Every week, my guests and I share the answers we found in the questions we have. Join us as we explore and expand our worldview and ask, what's my thesis? And today, my guest is Bridget Batch. And you told me that we met at the Ice Cream Social. Oh, is, yeah. Is that, Made that in was, LA. That was the mm-hmm. first? Okay. Because I know I've also known you not through Made in LA too, right? Like we've hung out, I think at at, at someone's birthday party. Oh, at, probably. Yeah, just like yeah. different artists connections in LA. Yeah, because yeah. I know Copernicus like is not a name that you forget. <laughs> <laughs> that's the name of my son. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, so I'm like, okay, but yeah, it is. It, it it's uh, it's been when was that social? That was like 2017. So I've known oh, you for quite a while. It was like the first made in LA. Second. Probably. Oh, second. Because um, I, was, I wasn't involved in the first one, but I was helping oh. out with the ice cream social at that one. Oh, okay. Well, you would know that better than me. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's, um, I met Salome first and then Molly Shulman, Salome Grace and Molly Shulman. Of and, made in LA. Of made in LA when they were first doing it. And I, I was in the 2017 one. Yeah. You, not the 2016 one? <sighs> Maybe I was in the 2016 one. Yeah. Oh, no, I can't remember. That that was the first. That would make sense if I was in the first one. Um, I did an installation piece at um, a studio I had in Highland Park at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that I had this kind of social practice installation um, that I called Campfire Stories. And I've done it in a few different locations around California. I first did it in Singapore, and then I got a grant to do it in New York. So um, so I did that for Made in L.A. as a practice for the New York one. I was really nervous about the Brooklyn one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, I don't remember which year it was, but because I've had that project kind of going off and on for a long time. So when you, you know. say social uh, social practice, what, what, what does that entail? Well, the whole point of the installation was to create an environment. It's a site-specific environment, um, depending. I, like, I had different, very different things in the Singaporean one than I did in like the California one or the Brooklyn one. And uh, so there were meant to be uh, signifiers within the space um, through video, through audio, and through objects gathered 
to um, bring out the mood of maybe being around the campfire. And when you're a kid, you tell scary stories around the campfire. So I wanted it slightly creepy. And then there were signs. Everyone had signs in various languages that would be specific to the location. In Singapore, they have four official languages. So I used those four official languages. And then... um, so I have to get translations, <laughs> depending on where I'm at. But uh, and then uh, you know different ones in New York and California, obviously. But it also like seeking out um, English and Spanish are the kind of obvious ones, but also seeking out indigenous languages. Mm-hmm. And uh, the sign is all an invitation to to talk and be around the campfire and speak to people. And what I found is that a lot of people really wanted that kind of quasi anonymous space to share really intimate stories too. Mm-hmm. I think the idea of feeling that you're in a campfire or maybe something like that's at night and a little bit spooky, like brought out the sense of a confessional almost. Mm-hmm. So people shared a lot of interesting stuff and none of that is documented only through photographs. Um, so that, you know, it keeps in anonymity. Sorry, I can't say that word apparently. So, Anonymity of the person involved. <laughs> I like the way you say it. I'm not even going to correct you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, I am not able to say that. <laughs> I have I have words like that too. So <laughs> it's always fun when you stumble on them. You're like, wait, why the fuck? <laughs> like, it's like, yeah, I have a master's happening? degree, but I can't say this. <laughs> so. It's like there's like a little glitch in your brain. Yeah. That <laughs> I'm not an actor. <laughs> it's like a scratch on a CD not to be an old person. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a CD? What's that? <laughs> it was a, a compact disc. Oh, I still don't know what that I is. I wonder if, people, if there's kids that know what a CD is, but they don't know what it stands for. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah I'm sure that exists. <laughs> yeah. Um, I always felt like Walkman was such a good brand name, but Discman was such a like lame, like yeah, derivative. I'm with, with you on that. Just call it all a Walkman. Yeah. It wasn't Tate Man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Walkman is such a good branding. I mean, yeah. Jesus. You like, walk it, around. <laughs> it's maybe the iPhone of the 80s, 90s. Yeah. That was a defining. I mean, it's also part of we use the smartphone that way now, like yeah. listening to music. It's a defining thing of also building this individuality in your own private space and within a public space. I was trying to explain this to somebody that was younger, but we were we were in the same age range. Yeah. And uh I I uh love the idea of um Sony and Japan being like the pinnacle uh, to, coolness. <laughs> of coolness and uh-huh. like and being the future and sci-fi. It, that I wasn't just imagining. That was a thing no, in the 80s, right? I think that was definitely a thing. <laughs> but you could do it now with like Oh, I don't know if it's the same, but the kids still love like, you know, manga and Pokemon. Yeah, and... In, in in terms, that's like entertainment that's kind of relegated to like, you know, like a niche. I, th- uh, yeah, I, 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 I think in the 80s, cyberpunk. like, do you remember like, uh, you know, the, the the Michael Douglas movie, Black Rain and all of those things were like, it was like all about, I did, uh, HBO just did a, a, a show called uh, uh, Tokyo Vice. It's not that great, but I think they were trying to recapture that kind of oh, vibe okay. of like the 90s, 80s and 90s where like Japan was the future. We were worried that Japan was going to be like, you know, in charge of everything, oh, like from a business right. standpoint. Right. I know remember? there was this really xenophobic like Japan bashing period at the yeah. turn of the 80s, 90s. But yeah, then also like huge. aggrandizing through yeah. like like television and media where it was like, mm-hmm. oh my God, these are like, this is these are the future business leaders of America. Meanwhile, China just completely like, <laughs> like but <laughs> but that but to that level, like where we thought Sony was like Sony and, and Japanese corporations were gonna be China, this little fucking island. Yeah. <laughs> America's crazy, y'all. <laughs> we always have been. But yeah. Yeah. The, the xenophobia <laughs> is real forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, also during that period, um, more British companies and more, um, I think, Saudi Arabian companies owned more property and more commercial investments in America than Japan. But everybody was afraid of Japan. Yeah, yeah. And like, like, hello, be afraid of England. <laughs> you know, didn't we, didn't we kind of like get rid of those guys? <laughs> but I think it was like, I mean... At the time, I think I think the Walkman and that kind of mentality. Yeah, it it was like that Nintendo. was like like that was bigger than Silicon Valley. Like I don't remember as a kid being like, oh yeah, Silicon Valley is important. Like it right. wasn't until like the the mid '90s where it started, like you know, with the tech boom, mm-hmm. that I really became even aware of Silicon Valley. Because mm-hmm. then you had all those people that became millionaires like 
in from one year to the next and then just retired <laughs> yeah yeah no no you're right i don't i don't remember knowing about silicon valley until the 90s yeah yeah so anyway just a, a trip down memory lane. What, what, what were you, uh, you grew up, where, where did you grow up? Because we talked a little bit about this off air, but I want people to have a context. Um, I, so I usually just say I'm from Minnesota. Um, I grew up in a town called Rochester, which is about uh, a small city in the middle of farms. Mm -hmm. It's not a suburb. It's not Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's, that's really unfortunate. Uh, and I might have liked it better if I had grown up in <laughs> Minneapolis, St. Paul, but I didn't. And um, it is very strange, though, because it has an IBM facility, uh, like this huge behemoth of an IBM facility, and um, the Mayo Clinic. So I grew up around a lot of uh, doctors and programmers mm -hmm. and, their, and their children. And my father actually uh, had a second career as a computer programmer, which is why we were there. And uh, so... Yeah, I guess I, but I wasn't thinking about Silicon Valley. I didn't know about it. <laughs> I right. think I think he felt like he was too old at age 40 in the 80s when he had to do that. Before that, he was an air traffic controller. Mm. And that was um the first union that got destroyed in the Reagan years. They tried Yay. to go on strike for better um <laughs> <laughs> for that I think they wanted more mental health leave and better pay because it's such a stressful job trying not to crash planes. And uh they were demolished in terms of yeah. that it was like a cultural reckoning. And I don't think it's that famous, but it's in the history books. It was in the Smithsonian. It shocked me. They had like a whole display about that strike. Wow. <laughs> but one of my earlier memories is where, uh, watch, marching in a Labor Day parade holding a picket sign. Oh, cool. So <laughs> That's awesome. That's pretty funny. Um, so that also... That's not funny. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, oh, I think it's funny. That's just one of my early memories. But yeah, and so my dad went back to school, basically, when I was a kid and became a computer programmer. And... Um, I did not see the ocean until I was eight years old. So now that I'm out in California, like, it's so amazing. You're from Florida. Like, I mean, can you imagine never seeing the ocean? Then, no. Like, then you're finally eight years old and you're just like, I mean, I read about it. I've yeah. seen it on TV. Like, but uh, I was like, amazing. So That's I love crazy. taking um, my own child to the beach. <laughs> yeah, no, that is crazy. I think I have been on the beach with you guys, with you and Copernicus playing Frisbee or something. Is yeah, I like a, Bryce, a, probably Bryce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, no, it is interesting, the idea of like growing up landlocked and like that is one of those privileges that you don't think of really. Like it's like, because I, I also know, I mean, I never lived in the uh, Calvin and Hobbes version of like having snow and <laughs> shit like that. But like, I remember. I totally know what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> I, I lived in that. You lived in that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you, you'll take the beach over that? Well, you can have the beach and snow. Oh, okay. I mean, you don't have a warm beach, but you can, I mean, New, York, you, New York State, like up in the Northeast, they have great beaches and snow. But I'm saying you don't have a preference over being, because uh, a lot of people would be like, fuck the cold. Oh, uh, like, no, I actually don't mind the cold. You don't mind the no, cold? I, no, I kind of miss seasons living in LA. Yeah. I really like LA, but I don't like LA for the weather. No, I, I mean, mean, I appreciate it. But, yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> yes and no. Like, I like wearing flip flops all the time, but. <laughs> so, and I like going to the ocean, like, any time of the year, even in the winter when it's kind of cold. But, um, but yeah, I like I like seasons. I like, like seeing seasons. the change and the variation. Yeah. So, yeah, I lived in New York for a long time and, and Brooklyn yeah. mostly. And, uh, yeah, so that they had the, that kind of thing there, but I have yeah. to say they have great beaches on Long, on Long Island. Really, really great because the water is warmer than California really? in the summer. It comes yeah. up from the Gulf a Stream, and um, well, now that I'm off on this, but like I just remember being at Jones Beach once and feeling like it was the happiest place in the world. You know, <laughs> whatever Disneyland, like there were people from every culture, like visibly, because like women with like their hair covered or something. And uh, just every race, every culture, it seemed like, and there were a lot of them. Everybody was happy. Everybody was getting along. And then you could go swimming and it was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought it was amazing. Craziest beaches I've ever been to uh, were in the Philippines. And then uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on from there. Yeah. But, <laughs> no, we're talking a lot about beaches. <laughs> but, what, but what I like about that, the crystal clear water and then the sand is like so fine that you they, they make... Uh, they sculpt with it. Like, it's kind of like a tourist trap thing. Oh, wow. Where they'll, like, sculpt these crazy structures because this, the, and they're, like, just, you know, um, 
the Zen garden rake patterns into the ground oh, wow. because it's like, it's so fine that you can, you, you know, it, you can actually make like little grooves in, in you know, like uh -huh. fine grooves on it. It's most detailed shit that I've ever seen. And I grew up in Florida again. So like that sand does not do this. Wow, and where the, was that at in the Philippines? Uh, it was you know? uh, Boracay. Uh, okay, yeah, it's, yeah, it's I've like, heard that's beautiful. Yeah, and mm. then um, and then the worst fucking sand of all. <laughs> now that I'm on this tangent, Galveston, Texas. Oh, I don't know, but I've heard of Galveston, Texas, it, it, uh, uh, before. But um, no, uh, Marco Island and 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 Naples. Where's that? Oh, Florida, uh, G G Florida Gulf Coast. Uh -huh. It is. You cannot walk on that shit barefoot. It is just shells that have been ground up. Oh, and it's like, okay. it'll, f I still remember the pain. <laughs> mm, okay, I'll remember that. <laughs> <laughs> just make sure that you, you know, that's back back in the days where Tevas were popular. Uh huh. You know, and uh, and then rusty surfwear and all that shit. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure it's still like that, though. <laughs> Even as fashion has moved on, the seashells remain. No, I know, but I was thinking more of those, like, th that was in the 90s when those first, those rubber-soled, like, <laughs> slip-on sock shoes came, on, came out. Do you oh, remember those? Oh, no, I don't. Yeah. I might have still been trapped in Minnesota. Oh, yeah, you might not, not, yeah. not have been. Yeah, because there's a l plenty of places that, that have, like, uh, bottom that you don't want to put your actual feet on. Oh, yes. <laughs> Whether it's, like, gross and slushy or... Mm -hmm. sharp and uh right. coral reefy but yeah mm -hmm. anyway. well minnesota does have a lot of lakes which can be kind of gross and slushy on slushy. the bottom or they have like algae <laughs> uh, but we're, they can be really nice and refreshing but you kind of you, you have to deal with that <laughs> we're trapped on beach yeah. conversation <laughs> island <laughs> we're totally in the water <laughs> i mean i've been swimming in the mississippi i don't know if that's a good idea <laughs> yeah no i i'm not uh an avid swimmer it turns out it like <laughs> wait all this beach all this beach conversation and you don't like to swim i no i love to swim in certain beaches but not you know like like marco island beach is cool mm -hmm. that's that's a good spot for snorkeling and whatnot anyway do you have a topic today so we can save ourselves out of this um i have not been making work about the beach really so <laughs> i did start talking about um that campfire stories and i did one in ventura so i actually used the beach <laughs> and these amazing things i found on it for that particular installation but yeah um i i can talk about well you know actually this is the perfect thing for this since we're doing this on a day that they want to do a, a moment of silence at 5 p.m across the world for climate emergency mm -hmm. um, and beaches were late uh <laughs> <laughs> losing shoreline uh a lot of my work for the last several years has had in one way shape or form centered on climate change uh not necessarily obviously but yeah i think that would be a good thing to talk about yeah sure um, I've started out just feeling very apocalyptic uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, and having, I've been a, like an environmentalist my whole life. It's it, like, since we're dating ourselves here, you know, climate change wasn't news in the eight. It was like, they were talking about it then. Mm -hmm. And I really find it incredible that though, though many have tried, I mean, gone to various lengths to try to get people to care. We still haven't you know, done it. And I think that that's because we have a, a collective imagination is very difficult to do. It's very hard to imagine how your life and your immediate needs and pleasures are involved in like the life of billions of people and in this entire thing in the planet. But, um, you know, that's the scenario we live with in our intertwined globalist society. And it's also, you know, kind of hopeful in that like, maybe you know people will like learn more things and like most of the time people do get along as much bad news as we have mm -hmm. you know most of the time uh ukraine and russia accepted and a few other places of conflict at the moment like yemen um like people do not engage in violent acts every day against each other so it's pretty interesting so hopefully we can really muster the will especially mm -hmm. as more and more people really feel the effects Whereas before, like, it was very abstract. It was like, in the future, things won't be, they'll be too hot and sea levels will rise. And that was, like, predicted before it happened. So uh, my own work, um, well, most recently, since I'm talking about it, uh, I've been making biochar. And I wanted to show these little sculptures. Oops. So um, it's small. <laughs> Uh, I find that most people haven't heard of biochar, so I'm going to explain it, although um, a web search will tell you what it is. I didn't invent it or anything. Uh, 
it's basically a different way of making charcoal. So this is charcoal that is um, that retains the carbon mm -hmm. uh, through the way that it's burned, because charcoal comes from burning uh, vegetation, right? This, these are wood pieces, and um, in retaining the car the carbon in the material in the block of burned wood, it's not going into the atmosphere. So it sequesters carbon from a, t a current climate term. And I, uh, I've actually had several false starts in trying to make <laughs> the biochar. So hopefully, I mean, I'm doing it on such a small scale, hopefully I haven't released too much carbon. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but now that I think I know how to do it, and it, it basically makes a very like light smoke, very little smoke, and it's very light colored. So the carbon and other uh, chemicals that cause, you know, the greenhouse effect, basically the global warming, um, stay in the materials themselves. And people use this to fertilize the soil. In fact, this is the ancient traditional indigenous way of um, doing like slash and burn agriculture. Mm -hmm. they, that was that used to be like seen as a very bad thing. But what they were doing when they involved, like burn materials out of the way to do the crops is that the carbon, which is a great fuel for plants, right? Carbon is what plants eat um stays in the soil doesn't go into the atmosphere and therefore it grows the crops better and that's why plants are also made out of carbon just like us but in terms of the carbon cycle uh having disrupted traditional agriculture with all of our modern agriculture has also enhanced the process well, of global warming but so you know. when you say that you mean most recently right like not not the, the you're not saying the agricultural revolution is implicitly a problem is that we abandoned some of those early or i'm not oh that's a good question um i think you could make an argument that the agricultural re re revolution is an implicit problem but that's different no it's not actually yeah. um in terms of global um climate change and fossil fuel burning it's um, I mean, to some extent, like using more and more wood for fuel in wood stoves as we've increased population has been a contributing factor. I mean, the biggest contributing factor is the emission of carbon through uh, industrial use and in automobiles, but uh, all these different ways. So biochar would, did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, no, I wasn't trying to indict the agricultural revolution. No, no, no. I, don't, I, I wasn't even saying <laughs> yeah. it like that to that, to that level. Yeah. No. Um, so okay but that is the anthropocene right that's like kind of so, when things change <laughs> so then when you when you um when you so like this if you burn it as charcoal like now, so now this you could put it in a grill is what is essentially what we're talking about I, and it won't release or uh, uh if i put it on the grill and burned it for a grill i think it would just act the same what, as any other charcoal so, so any then, other material so then what is the use for the biochar most charcoal? people use it for fertilizer okay so you can buy it to put into your garden on like small scale so i don't think i don't think anyone's well i'm actually not sure how large scale of people are using it but you can buy it as a garden additive okay yeah. so then what what uh what carbon does this reduce like just the like so fertilizer you typically fertilizers are pretty toxic or typical fertilizers are pretty okay. toxic yeah so and also at this point the industrialized american style farming that we're involved in i mean it's a tricky subject because there's also been things with the in terms of um <laughs> in terms of the green revolution that to some degree like we're very solving of famine in the 60s and 70s but those things also led into other severe problems like we have with monsanto and seeds mm. so i'm i'm not trying to get into that but i want to make sculptures so okay that's what that's what i'm doing here is i want to make particular sculptures um like but this is very soft and brittle and 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 working with that in like an eco way and hoping that i make a beautiful art piece but as well as you know bring some awareness but in terms of a massive uh use of the carbon i think um if there can be a way to dispose of certain things actually right now in the central valley in california they're 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 having a lot of trouble with farmers are building their dead crops from the water shortage that we're mm. experiencing with the drought but they're just burning it open air they're not even using it for that so they're causing uh, all kinds of air quality problems this there's not an air quality issue with this with this because there's so much less and um, so many less particulates which yeah. is the dark stuff and smoke and then um sort of anything i think uh, along these lines that would could be found massive industrial scale uses and then you're putting the 
you're putting that material and in, back into the soil, it's it's creating and completing the carbon cycle in a manner that's not just throwing it up into the air. My grandfather used to own uh, a, um, a what's it called a fertilizer business in Cuba. That's what oh. that's what uh, they lost in oh. the revolution. I don't well that was this, like 1960 right so yeah. <laughs> I don't I mean I'm not a, a fertilizer historian but now that you're asking me these questions I want to do more research on No no that. I was just well yeah. that, I I mean yeah. I don't have a follow up I'm just letting you yeah. know that 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 there is a tie in for me <laughs> <laughs> that I'm invested in what you're talking about because of that uh, One of the original fertilizer businesses though is that bird poop in fact there yeah. was a war fought in Ecuador over that I've told this story before, but yeah. uh, during the revolution, they put someone else in charge of my grandfather's business. Uh -huh. And he was like, my grandfather was like, hey, you got to sift all these chemicals to make them like, you know, usable so that you don't destroy the crop. Uh -huh. And the guy was like, nah, fuck it. So he didn't do it. And then that guy got charged with uh, sabotage. <laughs> so he, it was actually incompetence. <laughs> oh, sabotage because did something blow up? Because fertilizer is no, also like really no, explosive. mostly like the crops died. Oh, God. You know, but like it's just crazy. That's like, so sad. <laughs> but like he's, he's like, like, I'm not gonna listen to this to the capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it, it's funny. Anyway, yeah. there's there's a lot of gray area. We don't have to get into the politics of that. Yeah, I just think no. that that's a funny story. It is when, a, my, when my mom also told tragic, me, though. it's tragic. I yeah. mean, not for my grandfather. Yeah. I, he he lived to be 101. Oh, and, okay. and, he's and, Miami he turned out okay mm -hmm. uh but um yeah he worked until he was like 87 and fucking as a chemist for like it was funny right, because yeah. he, he you know since he worked for the sugar canes and you know who's the fucking granddaddy of the sugar canes is, uh, uh colonialism or what no uh isn't it, aren't they the cock coke brothers aren't they oh i didn't know that i thought that that's oh. i thought that's like their shit oh, um, i didn't know that anyways Possible? so my grandfather was would go to these adorable like dressed up old man like in his 80s like late 80s you know uh -huh. i don't think he retired until it was like 90 something wow he sounds great yeah and he's like cuban to the to, like couldn't fucking stop moving um and the and uh yeah so he my mom would dress him up uh, to like go and and rally for these i think it was like something about a tax uh, you know like uh, to do a rally in a corner of solidarity with like the, sh the you know his bosses and i was like i was like 15 or something i was like hey mom is this like legit like isn't this like kind of everything that we think is bad and he goes yeah but fuck it <laughs> he's, he's 87 like what are you gonna do like, you know it's his job so yeah. so i thought that was interesting uh I, that was a lesson in pragmatism that i got from my mom on that that's interesting yeah, yeah. that sounds cute i'm imagining this diminutive man with like a really cool hat yeah like a little yeah. just like a little soft like cloth baseball not like trucker baseball but like you know uh, okay. like ball caps oh okay i was more like panama hat or something I guess. <laughs> no, no i was like racist. thinking tropical no, style <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking tropical style, but okay. <laughs> Thanks. I'm totally joking. I'm totally joking. Thank you. Uh, I don't cancel it. <laughs> I have no authority to cancel anyone. Um, yeah, the uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. the The whole climate thing. There's so many things. Obviously, mm -hmm. I'm with you because I've I played uh, I played some like activists from Brazil when I was a kid in in a play like this shit oh, you know wow. uh yeah. about um about deforestation in the in the amazon and stuff so like this shit has been like it's really hard to grow up with all this like climate change stuff and then also you know like get to a place i think that overall like it's been pretty much just kind of made fun of the the idea of personal responsibility being the solution to the problem like which i'm not like that's not directed at you mm -hmm. just the cycles of of how we have had to like address these things right, right. like like it, as a as an individual a lot like growing up it was like oh your carbon footprint your carbon footprint mm -hmm. then you get into like fucking like how do you avoid that when it's a whole global system, right? Right. And then it's very difficult to yeah. avoid participating if you live in a modern, like, yeah, society of any sort. <laughs> so I have just kind of settled into like this weird ambivalence, which I know isn't serving me. But the other day, there was like, there were two fires I saw in the same day. Mm -hmm. I was driving on the Arroyo Seco, and I called like it's the I don't snitch for crimes, but I called fucking nine one one for for a fire because yeah, I'm like, yeah, as you should. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, and then 
like literally right next to my fucking apartment. So like oh, wow. I'm I'm here. And you and survived July fourth. Building... No, this wasn't even July fourth. This was like uh th- I mean, this was this week. And oh. and it was just like and I was like, God damn, like because there have been fires in LA before, but never something like that. Like I've never seen one on the Arroyo Seco is not what you think of. It's not like a fucking hillside. Like you over here, I'm used to seeing like hillsides burn. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like not mm-hmm. not like uh, I've never seen it really get that close to residential stuff. Mm-hmm. You okay. know? Yeah, that's and, disturbing. And then the like, I don't think that the one near my house was a climate change one, but mm-hmm. it was like it was the kind of thing where I was like, listen, hearing saws, and I was, and I got up and I was like. Is someone trying to steal my catalytic converter? Like that's how fucking loud it was. And I was like, "Oh, there's fire trucks. Oh shit. I'll show uh, you a video later." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no the real I'm the rest of this since we're doing this in the summer, I don't yeah. know when it'll come out. But yeah, just well, It's holding cr- my breath for the real fire season to kick in. Yeah, yeah, when does that start? Uh I think traditionally in California it was August to October. Because after months of dry spell, but there was a fire in January in Big Sur this year, yeah. and there's been fires, but none of them have gotten that big yet. Do those uh, make a biochar or no? Uh, no, they're, <laughs> everything's going straight up. <laughs> so what is the what's the burning process in biochar? You have to smother the flame, but not so much that you take all so much oxygen out that it can't burn, but it becomes kind of like if you've smothered a campfire and uh-huh. it's still smoldering a little bit underneath it. That's the biochar process. Or like when you when do you ever cook with uh, charcoal? Um, yeah. You know, like when you close it and they roast it, is that the kind of thing? I guess that technically much? that would, but most people aren't saving the yeah. whatever's coming from the charcoal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that's a good question. It sounds it's more like a roasting process. Rather yeah. Than... Oh, yeah. That's it's it's definitely the smothered flame. Like, cause, yeah. cause I, yeah, the, my experimentation has been the, like how smothered, <laughs> how smothered is the flame? Like the first time I tried to do it. I just, there was too much smoke and I thought my neighbors would call, like, even though it was very controlled, like I thought my neighbors were going to call the fire department. So I put it out with water, you know, I didn't, Mm. I didn't get it smothered the right way. And then, um, but once you, once you do, um, then there's just like a little tiny bit of white smoke, but there's, it's just smoldering underneath these materials. Yeah. So I think that I, I am not an expert and there would be other people to ask. Uh, I have done this because I got sick of doom scrolling. I used to, when I, um, I moved out to LA to go to graduate school. And when I was driving home from graduate school, I would be look, looking at uh, the dryness of LA because I'm not from a dry place and, and just be thinking intensely, even though that is actually somewhat natural to California. But I would just be thinking about how California is supposed to get drier and um, just all these doom things I read. I did for my my thesis project. Uh, what's my thesis? <laughs> uh, my what's my thesis project was an installation that was actually apocalyptic, but um, it was called "When We Are Robots, We Will Still Gaze at the Stars," mm-hmm. which is a title I happen to love. And it was a, I thought the idea of ro- robot children going camping, but we have robot <laughs> children because we've run out of water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so humans have sort of evolved into robots, and. Um, but it was apocalyptic, but maybe even hopeful, because who knows? Um, yeah. That can lead into the other saga I want to get into. So <laughs> yeah, for sure. Maybe we'll go back to that, or maybe I should do it now. But uh, uh, yeah, so I was just, I'm a naturally hopeful person. I've been hopeful I this whole that... time. So I just feel like we have to, the technology has to come in, like we have to do it. And But I, at this point, I also think we are the, I see um, what I would say younger people, uh, since I've somehow become gen x i wasn't when we were younger oh, what uh, were you what were you qualified? i was like under gen x it was older than me <laughs> they like wrapped i was born in the mid 70s they wrapped the mid 70s into it uh but the millennial the younger generations are really concerned with uh vocalizing and processing trauma and i think that that's actually a i'm not alone in this either i'm not going to take credit for the idea but uh like looking at a model of thinking of how to um help the earth process Mm. trauma or help our cultures process trauma because I think we come from I think any colonial culture which clearly as an American white person I'm from is uh carries with it a lot of abuse and um 
or I mean, yeah, honestly, I would just put that on patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> and there's there's a very abusive edge to it in terms of oppression on, um, you know, some group women of the other, the group that you're trying to take the land from, whoever it is, but also in yourself, because to keep that kind of mental attitude, you have to raise boys in a very, you know, toxically masculine way, right? About all about domination. And uh, I think that people trying to address that and say it's a trauma and we have to heal from it, like that could help lead to cultural changes that will lead to behavioral changes because technology alone isn't going to solve climate. Uh, technology is obviously really important. Like we yeah. have to do biochar and carbon sequestration on a massive level would be really great. And there are companies that are trying to do these things, but it's also going to have to be a way of thinking about how we interrelate with things. And there are other groups of people non from a non um, sort of, I'm going to say Judeo-Christian because some people say it's the Bible, the first words of the Bible, uh, giving dominion over the earth that to um, Adam or to man uh, is what led us to this, <laughs> what's mm -hmm. led to it, like the, the non, um, the lack of concern for animals in terms of uh, agriculture and, um, and all of that. So all of those things together, working to try to heal them, hopefully we'll, yeah, we'll come to some different um, points of view that could be helpful. Yeah. That's a bit utopian too, but. Well, I, yeah. I mean, this is, this is an interesting conversation for me because I have just become, I've just gone so far into the like, uh, ni n I mean, nihilist, not that I'm happy for the fucking way right. the world is. No, it's is depressing. Great, but I've just kind of resigned myself a little bit to it. Um, I think, I mean, and I'm not, I definitely, the point of this conversation is to get you to influence me, not me to influence you, obviously, because <laughs> I don't want to be hopeless uh -huh. and I don't want to crush your hope. So I'm definitely going to ask. You won't. <laughs> no, I know. My, but, well, I have days. I'm like, I'm just like, oh my God. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't think, I, it is such an interesting conversation though, because I mean, you know, we kind of talked like we're still fighting wars over liquid gas. We're still right. fight like, you know, Syria, yeah. uh, uh, the Ukraine, like that's what this is really about. This is it's only, resources, it's only about like America wants to sell natural gas to fucking Europe mm -hmm. and they don't want uh, 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 Russia to do it when they, Russia's already got that fucking market. It is crazy to me. And then, you know, I don't know. It it does seem like America is losing some unipolar hegemony in terms of like what is happening with the ruble being uh, a, a a currency that you can use to buy oil now as opposed like as opposed to just being like the petrodollar. Mm -hmm. Um it's also like okay, here's my cynicism. <laughs> <laughs> There's many places for cynicism. The 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 situation with uh, fucking Biden and like the reality is that, yeah, a a MBS is Mohammed bin Salman is not a good person, mm -hmm. but uh, and I am not for the model that we live in where, you know, we are helping Saudi Arabia bomb. Um, Yemen. Yemen. Yeah, I know. It's uh, terrible. Uh, like we're basically mm -hmm. they they're But like. We have fucked even that up in such a royal way where now 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 this guy goes over to uh like um biden goes over and this guy humiliates him he like he makes him associate with him and kind of embarrasses him for having called him a pariah and being treated a pariah and then doesn't give him shit like he made it he made biden fly out to saudi arabia mm -hmm. or to wherever it was i don't know if it was saudi arabia to the meeting and then and then didn't give him shit. It's like it's crazy. And then we have like the ambition. I I just don't see how the military the militarization. Like you talk about hope and culture, but there's no anti-war movement anywhere. I like I'm surprised no one talks about Yemen. You know, like oh yeah, you, people don't talk. People about don't it, know right? about that shit. The only mm -hmm. thing that people talk about is how evil Putin is. And I'm like, okay, yeah, he's not a great fucking guy, but like we're doing mo more relativism here <laughs> like how are we making that work right like like <laughs> the and even things like fucking uh you got people like elon musk saying like we're, we'll coup whoever the fuck we want over over um lithium right in bolivia 
I, I don't know oh, if you saw his text. No, I didn't see he that. He texted, oh, that's yeah. Gross. That's gross. Yeah. So like, but that is kind of how, like, so for me. That's how, yeah, industrial colonial cultures operated for a long time. But we still are. Yeah. We, we're still very much. And I think that, the, like, you know, I don't know. For me, for me, that is where I am engaged. Like, I think I've done stuff about environment kind of like peripherally, you know, like, mm-hmm. but ultimately my outlook is more ironic and cynical than hopeful and like so we, we, before we started recording you said that you felt like you wanted to do something and uh, with, like in terms of like contributing can you talk a little bit more about that oh well i was gonna say i i just i couldn't doom scroll anymore um uh, between the pandemic and uh being quite aware of so many issues with climate um yeah I, and then the ukraine war well it, it <laughs> like it, i just couldn't keep doing it yeah. so i really wanted and yeah man <laughs> there's like so many things we could like no because if because if you only about. focus if you only mm-hmm. focus like you that you just made me realize that like i am not even my my scope isn't broad enough and it's already overwhelming me you know mine is entirely over imperialism and i'm not even and i and i kind of acknowledge that it's like maybe one of the biggest polluters right like having all these military bases all over the world there's abby martin i don't know if you know who she is she's a journalist uh she did she's the one that did uh she had a big impact on how uh, people started seeing the palestinian plate because she Uh, went and she started recording um like uh the israelis talking about like in genocidal terms talking about uh muslims and just being uh, like oh we need to fucking bomb them oh we just need to kill them and like and like but and, all militaries are like that i mean well, how do you think american military talks about whoever no these were yeah. citizens oh, the, the, yeah. they, they were well i mean the, you could argue that there are everybody has to go through military there right and, yeah that's and, true. and uh, that's not to alienate uh israelis i'm just saying that there is a militaristic culture there yeah uh and then anyway so now so she did a movie called gaza fights for freedom it's pretty fucked up what happens there uh-huh. uh and and then now she's doing uh now her current documentary work is uh, is around this art uh, so you might find it interesting to like yeah, to, sure. to to look into Mm -hmm. but basically yeah so her her main case is that like one of the biggest fucking polluters is is our is our military particularly by like a huge long shot a hundred percent you know like by fucking insane amounts of and and then you we're talking about like by you know like fucking mass graves and shit like that like oh you know like that it 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 gets dark man it 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 gets really fucking dark so that's why now you this conversation making me realize why i don't think about climate change (laughs) (laughs) because i because i take on all this other bullshit (laughs) i think anti-war was where i first um i mean i started out that, but to be honest, when I was eight years old, I was um, reading books about Native American cultures and crying. Yeah, yeah. Because I was like, what, 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 we did this? <laughs> and, and, you know, I have like a European family that was here from the get go. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We did. <laughs> uh, but um, I don't know any particular stories about it, but uh, that that's just embedded in in the Manifest Destiny and the Homestead Act and colonization of America. What's the Homestead Act? The Homestead Act was, um, I can't tell you the year, but it was an act, I'm going to say in the late 18, second part of the 1800s, maybe post-Civil War, where if you went out to the Western territories and you farmed them for five years, you owned a parcel of land. I don't Mm. know how big it was, um, but you could easily find these details. So that is where my family probably comes in because we were like, well, the ones who were that late to it were like poor northern farmers. And um, they uh, they basically, yeah, they went out, they, you build a sod house or a wooden house, but on the prairie, there's not that much wood. So people made them out of sod. And my grandfather apparently lived in a sod house at some point. And you would get What's like sod. Sod is grass. Okay. So like turf. Okay. I mean, it's not really grass like you think of like beautiful green. Kentucky bluegrass, but uh, turf, you'd build it kind of half underground as save it from the elements. And it was a homestead act that led to the Dust Bowl. So basically everything west of the Mississippi fell under, if you could get out there and you could get the land um, from the east um, as a white person, I don't actually know if like 
but this is freed slaves could do it or not uh they then you could do it so you just had to fight hostile natives this is I, I, this quotes, is i mean all yeah. like irony in that you know this is the uh um like uh cowboy era uh-huh okay. yeah cowboy right. it's, so it's it's the cowboys are the cowboys in the u.s military out there are protecting the settlers yeah yeah from the yeah, people who are exactly defending their land Israel. it's like the <laughs> yeah. same model. So they're, they're defending they're the settlers. literally yeah. i literally saw videos mm -hmm. i think maybe yesterday or the day before mm -hmm. and and i'm gonna include this in here because it'll still be timeless and it'll probably have happened whenever this airs it'll probably have happened like yeah. two days ago from then it's right. the same thing with school shootings like you can be like oh god <laughs> you can be like you know how many school shootings there are? oh i'm sorry i i know you have a kid so i, I have a kid that i, though, I don't want to yeah. i don't want to joke too much around about about this with well, too much cynicism cynicism yeah. uh i mean and irony, I, but, yeah it's but real. uh there are more there i think there's like maybe two a day so far in this year school shootings or mass shootings? mass shootings yeah there's a lot yeah i mean it's crazy well this country seems to have a suicidal impulse going on because a mass shooting is a suicide act yeah. right and um well, I I think so for the most part. Like a school shooting is definitely those, well, and they suicide, were planning on dying. There's also a school of thought that uh, mm -hmm. says that suicide is homicidal because you are destroying the oh, universe. That's right. You're destroying everything. The energy. You're, everything. Yeah. Not e not even just yourself. You're just it, it, it's destroying everything external, everything internal. So it's an interesting, ah, that's and, interesting. and and I'm very a sensitive. note of consciousness. Yeah, I, I'm and I'm very. Um, very sensitive to that stuff because I've spent a lot of time contemplating it in, over the years. You know, I'm I'm uh -huh. unmedicated and I'm fine, so I don't uh -huh. want to be insensitive. But it is an interesting concept, the idea of it being homicidal, where it's like, it's it, uh, even though it's self inflicted, the idea of just extinguishing everybody else, right? Because you're removing them from your life. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. I never I never thought of it that way. Yeah, I someone just yeah. recently uh, a podcast. It was a last podcast on the left talked about it and i was like oh that's really fucking interesting um well yeah. the rates of suicide are, are high they're really up and i mean i think Not we're, you're gonna have to put trigger warnings on this podcast <laughs> oh that's a, that's the show <laughs> <laughs> so like, uh, but like i mean uh there there does seem to be a very strong nihilism in america right now because of i mean trump and january 6th and yeah either you're like a really angry right-wing person who thinks that all hell's going to the country is going to hell in a handbasket or else you're everybody else who thinks is going to hell in a handbasket in a different way and or the world is ending because of climate yeah. change it's 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 a lot of stuff and that pandemic lockdown and yeah and that people dying of covid is <laughs> well like, it's know. crazy because now uh there's like a 15 percent increase in uh in it, it there's a 15 they call it excess death aside from um like covid deaths there are 15 there's been a 15 percent increase in in like just mortality of non-covid related oh, deaths right. and just there's stress and the, depression and, 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 yeah and and a lot of people are dying at home and so one of the one of the things that are being posited is that there's that that accounts for the suicide rate increase where it's like the, mm. uh, if there if there's a rate of increase in people dying at home that would probably include those people, right? Like the, mm -hmm. the, the people that, and actually I think I'm going to have to like bleep out every time I say that word <laughs> <laughs> because on, I think it's like a, a, against TOS on, on YouTube to even say the word, but oh, that's, that's fine. I, I mean, mm -hmm. we can still have this conversation. I don't think we're like at all encouraging anybody to consider this stuff. Absolutely Please. not. No. And if you're having it, these thoughts and you're listening to this conversation, take this as a sign that you should go talk to somebody about it. Okay. Cause we are not at all it, it, t taking that shit light. It is not a not happy there's thing. There's websites where people will respond to you immediately in a yeah. chat. Um, yeah. I don't know the address. I I do know that there's a suicide prevention hotline. hotline. You can mm -hmm. always look that you can up. Call you and know. then they'll have the website with it, so you can do all of that and do it very privately too. If yeah. you feel like you can't talk aloud in your house if you're young or something. And I've you know. had those thoughts before. I'm so far removed that sometimes I forget how 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 sensitive you have to be about these things. How intense. Yeah, but yeah. but it is it is a, t a scary thing. And think about that. Like I mean, just that's that's a. Uh, I don't think I've ever been that sad. As much as as clo as much as I'm considering it, considered mm -hmm. it, I don't think I've ever been that to that level. So, um, you know, it's 
if you're having those thoughts, like you like definitely get help. But anyway, we can change the subject now. Uh, and, uh, I'll and bring Bobby, it back to art. <laughs> you know, no, and we can just talk about how the world is going to fucking slowly end. <laughs> Maybe you should stop. If you're having suicidal thoughts, don't watch this episode. <laughs> Go get help. We did talk we're about gonna a talk lot about of dark some, things. <laughs> so, yeah, this is only going to be dark. It's not going to help you. <laughs> well, I was going to say, actually, I believe art is um, one place for hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and for a variety of reasons. There's many different capabilities for that. So I bring up climate change and not wanting to doom scroll anymore because it's too depressing. Uh, and I still have to live my life. Um, you know, when I had my child, which was seven years, eight, almost eight years ago, it was, um, I mean, I was researching these issues and thinking about them. I'm like, what are, you know, what are you bringing a child into? This is a question. But there have always been massive problems in the yeah. world. Uh, disease, uh, COVID, now we had the pandemic, but really only the last 100 years was a sort of golden age where a lot of countries didn't experience a mass pandemic. Before that, there was a influenza right after World War I, and then there was polio and measles were kind of pandemics in the 60s mm. or 50s or whenever. But and before that, you know, the, there's cholera, the plague, you know, the invention of antibiotics and being able to wash your hands to just deal with a lot of things and modern sewage is just take taking a huge um huge burden off of people in terms yeah. of illness and then and then there's also uh um other things i mean there's a lot more people living in a semi democratic society now than probably at any point in history so i think that's hopeful uh you know there, there's there's different ways we have some treatments that we are always finding new treatments i mean even the way that there's treatments for HIV. That was a big deal when I was growing yeah. up. They didn't have that yet. So like, and when I was growing up, it was the end of the Cold War, like in the 80s. So they're still like- When did the Cold War end? 89. It's, it's not over. <laughs> what are you I talking mean, about? I mean, like fearing nuclear Armageddon isn't a big deal right now. What the fuck are you talking about? I don't think, I don't think most people think about it. I the know way they, they should to... fucking be scared. They should be fucking terrified. Okay. There are people right- I'm sorry. I'm not angry at you. I'm just so surprised by your statement. I don't think people think about it. People no, are, but I like think, it was like a daily reality of thinking know, about that. I understand what you're saying. So I think it should something. be a daily reality. There's I think always every, something. Did you see the thing that came out in New York about like get inside, take your clothes off? You, I don't know. No, they're like there's pro there's legit I think that I think that maybe you are not seeing it yet <laughs> but i think part like people are bringing that up again there is a huge discussion like the the uh henry kissinger attitude towards tactical nukes mm -hmm. is a huge part of the fucking discourse and to me this is like a huge problem because all of this is about energy we starve people in venezuela because they want to use their resources for right. themselves it is like we are the fucking problem in it in, in, in many in, ways yes in, in a lot of this yes and i and and that's true and i think that you are actually anti-war enough to listen to the nuances in my argument and not being like Putin is bad. Yeah, Putin's a fucking dick. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it's. I mean, it's interesting that you bring that up. I. I mean, yeah, I'm pretty. Anti I'm incredibly anti-war. I grew up. My father was a veteran of Vietnam, mm. and mm. that ended up having mm. all kinds of implications. <laughs> so, like the real fucking left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, basically, I would say that there was a lot of emotional trauma that came out of uh, witnessing a war by or being involved in a war. For your father? For my father. Um, emotional trauma tends to get visited down generation. You know, most people have that in some way because most of our families have experienced some degree of war or something at some point mm -hmm. for whatever reason. So there's all this generational trauma from whatever uh, conflict and that kind of goes into this idea of like tr trying to heal certain aspects of trauma in terms of changing the imperialist world war because a world view because a war is an act of imperialism and war is almost always over resources so it's you know, you want yeah. the resources someone else is controlling. We're looking at you people that always blame religion. <laughs> I mean, the religion is a tool. It's a really good tool. Religion is just part of that resource grab. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, look at Israel. Like yeah. the Middle look East at the is like Vatican. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
God, <laughs> but like the Middle East is like they're they're strapped for water. They're gonna yeah. fight over the the resource, and yeah. then they you know whatever it is that like that's just been there forever. And I suppose in the United States, I don't I don't know where we're going. You know, some people think a civil war is a brewing, but yeah, like at least the colonialist mentality of building the United States was about resources, obviously. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, mm-hmm. I I to me the idea of a of a uh civil war is such a like i know it's happened here before mm-hmm. but like that war was over resources resources i mean <laughs> who wants to pay wages if you can just yeah. have slaves <laughs> like, uh i don't know that there's i i don't think a war is going to be fought over abortion i don't think no i don't think i don't either. think i think that mm-hmm. unfortunately i okay so i am pro-choice a hundred percent unfortunately the argument is more emotional and more fervent if you actually think that people are killing children. I, I'm aware of it, that. I know, I, I, I know people who yeah, feel that way. Yeah. I, it's, I, I have never had an argument with a pro-choice person, or I've never seen, I'm, not that I argue would argue against the thing that I agree with, but I've never seen that level of passion mm-hmm. over, like, it's, you can't reason somebody into something they were not reasoned into. It's an intuitive thing. And I think that the position of choice is a reasonable one, whereas the position of life is a very, like, intuitive, like, it's, you know, it, it's not necessarily based on any reality, you know? I just wish they would take all their passion and go adopt children or volunteer at women's shelters or, you know, do, you know, if you care so much about these babies, go do something, yeah. which nobody I've ever known who was extremely anti-choice has ever i've never seen that happen but it's interesting because you then you also have on the other side mm-hmm. of that is like wasn't the person that was uh that founded planned parenthood like incredibly racist i and heard that recently i, didn't I don't know, know if that. that's true. i'm not surprised yeah. that was an era where there was sterilization and such it doesn't but surprise me but it's interesting when you have eugenics when you have yeah well you know what mm-hmm. you know who believed in eugenics a lot of people the progressive party yeah because they thought they would rid the world of undesirable <laughs> things or something yeah i believe believe that okay uh, yeah I, I love that uh that that we're actually on the same page because you said you before we started talking you were talking about like uh the new york times and sometimes i think of that as a red flag uh, <laughs> i i do read a lot i mean i am a former new yorker for one no it's but fu- the new york times does all kinds of fucked up stuff they endorsed the lie that started the iraq war no, the, yeah, you have yeah, to you have uh, to uh, but like sometimes you just have to kind of just get them I don't know. Like, I would rather just get things from the source. Like, I've been listening to the Trump hearings because I can do it while I'm working at my job. Mm. I have a day job. And that's been really interesting rather than this l- listening to commentators go yeah. over it. But you don't know. You don't have most people don't have the time for doing that. For that it got my attention enough that I could do it during my job. And it's also or like a couple long drives and you can listen to it after the fact if it's not happening at a convenient time. But um, yeah, it would be great to like just to really gather information and do it yourself, but we can't because that's, I guess that's attention economy. So then artists are one researchers who do that. I keep bringing <laughs> it back to art. <laughs> so, it's like, an art show. It's an art show. Artists, so I mean, art, a lot of artists work on a political thing and then they invest a lot of energy into yeah. that research and they can be one of the distillers for the audience of those yeah. issues like we're talking about that and that can be one thing or they can be doing something healing to heal from the trauma since i keep bringing that up no <laughs> yeah. and and i'm not and it's all oh, first of all i yeah. do want to note that you called it trauma and not ptsd because i think trauma <laughs> i think there's a stage bef- beyond trauma when you're dealing with like vietnam war uh, oh uh, uh, you, you well know. Uh, yeah i'm yeah. speaking globally about trauma. no I, yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, you were speaking sort of. you were speaking inclusively and i appreciate that but i think the fucking level of like and i think that there's mm-hmm. a lot of interesting stuff like uh I don't know if this is factual, but I I heard someone recently say that like a lot of the gang violence that 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 rose because it you like you know the Watts riots and all of those were actually mostly fist fights and whatnot and and uh, didn't involve firearms. A lot of that was people that came back with PTSD from Vietnam. 
Oh, so that's an that interesting. I don't surprising. I don't know. I don't know if that's factual. Yeah. Every fact I state today is going to have that. <laughs> we but... should, we're we're going to do the fact checking episode. <laughs> Javier and I will be back on, and we will have our sources and be like, okay, so we were wrong about this, but we were right about that. We were on, but no, we're, of course we're right about well, everything. Duh. What are the things? I just that... feel like okay, war. It's obvious. Don't kill people. Yeah. Don't engage in violence. Um. Let's leave abortion out of it. I have to say, I was very pro-choice when I was pregnant. I was like, "It's in my body," <laughs> like, but um, but like, we'll leave abortion out of it because that's a very philosophical conversation. But like, just yeah, don't don't kill people. And most societies generally respect the right to life in almost all instances. So how can you have a society and then kill somebody else for something? And I, uh, but it's also something that's existed since the beginning of humankind. So it is, you know, there is a homicidal streak to human culture. Yeah, definitely. that's very clearly there. And I, 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 that's my utopian thing is like, how do we get rid of that? Do we do it by healing um, abuse and generational trauma? Uh, then therefore healing the planet? Is that that that's one that's the first place I kind of have gone with that. But um, I think it's really important because, yeah, the man uh, suffered for his PTSD. Yeah. I can only imagine what Vietnamese people suffered. Yeah. I mean, they like just watched it all in their home. I worked on a Vietnamese yeah. podcast for a while and uh -huh. it's a lot. Yeah. And then the, the Vietnamese refugees in the, in the United States, like in France or wherever, they suffered from the displacement from yeah. their home. The Vietnamese who were there suffered from rebuilding after I mean, everybody suffered <laughs> the soldiers mostly didn't including my father didn't want to be there and they suffered <laughs> yeah, yeah and uh did he smoke any good weed though i you know <laughs> did my... he listen to i love how in the in in the fucking like our our the representation it, if it wasn't for fucking oliver stone <laughs> there would be no like horrifying <laughs> and then uh, uh what's it called not heart of darkness but the uh, the movie the one apocalypse now yeah, the, yeah that the, one's crazy yeah i still haven't seen heart of darkness but yeah like well, that's the book yeah but, but they oh didn't they isn't it also a documentary oh did they, they probably did oh, yeah, yeah that's yeah, the yeah. one his think, wife made yes, francis yes, Ford yes, Cop yes, yes, so yeah. francis Ford coppola's wife is also an artist a conceptual yeah. artist yeah and she made that so documentary yeah. i've heard about it and i really yeah. want to see it because i haven't seen it either um but so here's something interesting okay <laughs> Can we cover more ground? <laughs> yeah, we're actually getting into we're... it. Well, now that I know that you have uh, this uh, this thing with the Vietnam that is personal to you, because uh -huh. like I'm not a fucking saint. I don't care about imperialism for any other reason that I'm Cuban, and it affects me. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not like you know, uh -huh. and, and and not just that. And like I speak Spanish, so like I speak to everybody that it affects. You know, like right. I have a common language. It's like you know, like when I go up to a Latino. I don't go like, hey, man, what's up? Uh, I'm, I'm like, hey, imperialism sucks, right? <laughs> I'm not like, hey, did you watch the basketball game or the soccer game? I mean, I may, but like usually like usually like when we the there's a moment in the conversation where we're like. This place sucks, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> what did we do to you again? <laughs> you know, to I your know. country. <laughs> but um, yeah, so. And America has a lot of that, you know. Yeah. After after those movies were made, mm -hmm. the CIA made a very big point to m have offices out here in LA. Hmm. So that's why you don't get movies like that. I think the la the closest thing to a movie like that that I can remember is going to be like the Spike Jones one, The Three Kings about the Iraq War, mm -hmm. the first Gulf War. That's like the first that's one of the ones that's kind of like it's not as fucking real is like you know oh. uh apocalypse now or which, which is the one where the guys are frag w william defoe and uh what's his name are trying to frag each other um oh i don't know actually ah uh, what's it called it's i think it's got charlie sheen in it it's the one with him anyway uh, okay or the deer hunter no i haven't seen that one. Oh my god <laughs> that but anyway intense. movies like that aren't made yeah. anymore mm -hmm. i mean the u.s military is all over the planet so we sell weapons to saudi arabia for yemen we're selling we're giving or selling weapons to the ukraine and it's and after that Syria, it's probably anything. Shit, yeah, yeah anything, we're holding anything. we're holding a property in syria the property that we're holding syria has all the resources oh gosh <laughs> yeah i mean yeah no we are the, but it's, and this is a, uh, I just love this expression, heavy is the head that wears a crown. Americans suffer from huge rates of depression and huge rates of obesity. 
uh, generally unhappy because of like inequality. But I, I think it's that too. And um, I mean, Michael Moore talks about that in Bowling for Columbine. He says that they, they made all those nuclear warheads, if they maybe still do, in Littleton, Colorado, where Columbine High School was, is, was, and uh, that they would ship the nuclear arms out at 3 a.m. while the children of Littleton were asleep so they wouldn't see it. Mm -hmm. But that's, they're connected to it. Their parents work at those places, you know, yeah. either physically building them or designing them. And, I mean, they know it. Like, we're all connected to this stuff. Which we're all connected to the climate too, so yeah. you ha you have to, and you know, for better and for worse, there's good things that happen out of some of these things we talk about. I'm not sure if I really want to make that argument. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, that just came out of my mouth. Like, like there's nothing good about nuclear warheads. Uh, oh no, you could make the argument that it did work as a deterrent because there hasn't been a world war since then. But I don't know. That was like. Yeah, that's it's a all libertarian been, argument. Yeah, I don't know. It's all been proxy wars. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's proxy wars. They still kill thousands and thousands of people. But you know, Afghanistan yeah. is cool. <laughs> yeah, and no. just just see who invades it next. Well, <laughs> It'll I will be say Russia's this. Turn next, I guess. I will say this. Yeah. The way of the world is very clear in that if you are Muammar Gaddafi, mm -hmm. the biggest fuck up Muammar Gaddafi did, whatever you think of him, was get rid of his nukes. And that's why North Korea is never going to fucking do it. They saw what we did. Mm -hmm. They saw, they, they were like, oh, normalizing relations. We'll get rid of our nuclear program. Fuck that. But uh, so what are things that are happening in the, in the uh, nature climate change space that are exciting and hopeful so that we can end? Uh, well, I was going to say, like, so we don't just doom scroll. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there, I mean, there's, if you, don't have hope you i mean if if you're really nihilist what do you care like you're not going to be an activist because there's no point in fighting for something if there's never like you you have to even as even as unhopeful as things can seem like if there is really no hope there's no point in fighting and then um and i think that humans you know we oscillate with that we get to despairing places but we also get very creative in how to deal with um situations of despair and problems and those are positive things i'm not saying i want problems so that we like come up with creative solutions <laughs> it's not that it's just um but those you know we we keep doing that and sometimes rising to certain occasions so will we be able to do that with the climate and um and can we make art that like that goes more in that direction or I mean, I think art can be building awareness, uh, built and building those bridges, and yeah, just just doing that. So I guess it, it got to like a scientific thing for me, but um, but what else are we supposed to do? You know? Well, but I'm just saying, like, if we can mm -hmm. leave with do you do you know of like any particular projects like that or land reclamation things or sh shit like that that you're aware of? I'm not a, I'm not a super expert. Um, I do know of like some capitalist strains where people are investing more in companies that are doing carbon sequestration, which is trying to bury carbon mm -hmm. underground. I'm a little confused about what like <laughs> what happens to the carbon once it's back underground or but there's like a company building a huge project in Iceland that's going to do that. So and then you can do it with towers. Um, yeah, what I, I mean, the, the huge part of climate change is the problem of scale, because obviously it needs to happen in a math, but rapid way. And everybody can't, you know. Did you see Booty J I'm sorry. I I feel like I've worn you fucking down. I'm so such an asshole. You're not wearing you're not I've no, you. it's I've, more I've, the world I've, is <laughs> wearing me down. No, you're not wearing me down at all. That's a great conversation. I'm, tr I'm trying to get a, a beat about it. Yeah. Uh did you see the uh, Pete Booty Judge uh commercial that, that just came out? Basically no. that he did a thing where he's like uh as like he wants to teach other countries on how to fight climate change with uh, the, uh, well, your reaction is appropriate. Uh, with, with, like, the, basically what the 
Department of Transportation under him has done is they've like uh -huh. made a website of resources that people can use oh so they God. can like figure out how to build braille systems. And I'm like listening to this motherfucker. I'm like, why doesn't why don't we get that from China? Because their infrastructure is way better than ours right now. It's fucking not entirely. <laughs> I can say that from having gone to China. Well, the bullet trains are better. <laughs> yeah, the train. Yeah, yeah, that. That like maybe I, they're not investing as much anymore. Uh, I mean. Uh, it just yeah china is its own got it, a lot of its own problems so I, I, that might distract it from taking over the world <laughs> uh but uh that sounds ridiculous why would but that's propaganda that, i mean the, the u.s government's always done have you ever seen new deal movies no. made by the works project administration they're propaganda for dams oh, really? they were building dams which is what they thought was the solution at the time and uh, might come back in California because now moisture is not falling as snow. It's falling as rain and just like rushing down the mountains and not sitting in the soil the way that snow would. And um, so maybe people will bring dams back. Uh, I, I mean, I think, I think these things are very complicated, but maybe we should just start with like no more war. It's, it's, it's stupid. I think that it would hurts just be generations the best. of yeah. people and it's expensive and. It only serves like the one percent. Yeah, and it only serves the one. I mean, it's really conducted over resources for a very small amount of people. If the if there mm. is anything that is going to drain people on the idea of benevolent war, it is going to be the pr gas prices right now. I am so surprised at where we stand right after this conversation. I was going to avoid a lot of this because when you brought up the New York Times. <laughs> oh, just because I brought up the New York Times? Not just that. And oh. because because you brought up Ezra Klein because he's also notoriously a shit lib. Oh, uh, he's, I mean, he's like doing a lot of investigation of the, of the problems of liberalism. Like why haven't the liberals built the things that you would think they would build? I but actually think he like has a lot of good conversations. The problem, the, the problem with liberalism is that they don't realize that uh, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were liberals. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, see, I see what you're saying. I don't, I don't know. I am a, I'm a little softer than you. Cause I, this, this is a problem I get into. Um, and, I mean, I'm very judgmental in some ways, but in some ways I'm not. Everybody has their story. Even someone who has politics or beliefs that are completely repellent to me, mm -hmm. they're still a human with a story. Oh, I'm definitely with you on that. And they, they came to it. Except for like first... booty judge, though. Uh, <laughs> except for booty judge. <laughs> I mean, they came to it. So... That, I mean, might, that a guy lot was made in a, fact, in a CIA factory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right um no but just i mean our pedophiles uh, which is a really weird thing that the right has taken up that i'm just like huh um yeah that's really interesting um because yeah <laughs> i'm just saying like everybody has you know a lot of people are ignorant and I think just need better education but i don't think they get better educated by being told they're assholes i don't think that really works like to sit for the for the and I've always worried about I mean I'm just oh, gonna, I mean, I think I'm gonna go on record and say it. I've always worried about the left eating itself because there's always like there's a lot of purity in ideology and um You're and saying left left be left or left be right? Left v left. But oh. also if the left is um you know, if pr progressives are telling people, Republicans that they're a bunch of assholes, even if you really feel that way, you aren't winning converts that way. <laughs> so yeah, I've been a hardcore pacifist my yeah. entire life. <laughs> I think we definitely have that. Yeah. Like just, <laughs> I mean, you can... Actually, yeah. I don't think we disagree on anything so far. Not too much. No, not too no. much. I, I mean, guess you just probably, quibbles. Because I mentioned the New York Times. Well, I just, I'm interested in this like argument about liberalism. Like, I think certain liberal ideals are like the good guy ideals of like, you know, everyone having rights and freedom. I, I do kind of believe in those things. We I, can talk about imperial power, but at the end of the day, we also have I think have liberalism li is, is imperialist. Liberalism is imperialist. And, and, and neoliberalism especially. But like these, but if you're, if you're talking about those ideas, like how do you make sure to provide for people? Like how do you have a function? What, what do you need? Do you need government? Well, how do we have a fun functional system? So the reason we have government is because... Well, I think that, know, I think that the... the uh, the problem with liberalism is that it's tolerant of like people's lifestyles and things like that. Right. Like, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, they're not 
Like it's very pro corporate. It's not like that, yeah, that's neoliberalism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, we're talking pro like free trade it, seven, and... seven, seven, yeah, pro free trade. Mm-hmm. Well, free trade that's an interesting thing because it's like you are like okay, the right wing is anti immigration and the 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 left wing is uh, pro free trade, right? But it's essentially the same fucking problem. It's a it's an issue of competition with the external world, right? Right. Yeah. Free trade makes you compete against. It's the same shit. Yeah. yeah. It's, so like immigration, one makes you compete with people inside your borders. Free trade makes you compete with people outside of the borders, mm-hmm. right? And then what you have now is you have a situation where the where like we're getting hollowed out in the in the middle of the fucking like there's no middle class because of that, and now borders are basically just prisons. And we yeah. can't go work where the like we yeah. can't like I complain I can't go to Europe <laughs> or not even that if we yeah. wanted to fucking live in in El Salvador and at at uh, at and and get you know what used to be called sweatshop wages but live at that market rate where in fact you're actually outperforming everybody else even though you're getting paid less than an American would you're getting cents on the dollar but no one else is getting cents on the dollar so you're actually in a good position like we don't have that option we can't go compete in the and like I can't you know. That's a, no, that's a really good point. Actually, well, this is, I mean, this is why I said borders are, I mean, borders are, are lines. They're not, I mean, prisons is a really great way to put it, but they're, they're um, completely subjective. They yeah. exist out of an imaginary thing in an imaginary place because of basically someone's imagination. I mean, you know, there were, and but that's an interesting but beyond going back in the history let me just finish sorry and but now that we have this set up i mean we have ch- much much cheaper food in this country if you eat out at a restaurant in new york they're paying immigrant uh not undocumented labor to do all the busing and all the uh dishwashing i mean any any restaurant in new york student i i worked in that <laughs> and uh, i mean their servers might be like white americans like myself <laughs> college mm-hmm. educated but like they 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 have a whole ton of undocumented labor doing all this other back labor and if they had to pay the real benefits and the real wages for them your meal would cost twice as much and the restaurant can't compete that way so they feel they have to but our entire system now is set up that way and it's set up on the backs of all these poor people coming here from these other countries so i mean it's just really fucked like i mean and it's that's why we have a service that's why we have a service economy (laughs) yeah you know like uh it 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 also reminds me of like when when we first started getting cheap goods from china Mm -hmm. and it was like yo this is dope and no one realized like Oh, uh, this is not sustainable because your wages are going to come down to match that because we're not making that shit here, you know? Like, like, yeah, yeah that shit is cheap because they're not getting paid over there, but no one's getting paid over here now. Yeah. And then, so it's it's crazy. and if you buy anything from China, that's their con- con- their factories are polluting the fuck out of the atmosphere. So yeah. like, and you paid for that. Cause yeah, yeah, you bought it there. Apple. Do they still have? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's one of the cameras shooting us. So. Uh, I mean, <laughs> don't talk uh, too much shit. It's uh, good, you're gonna hurt you, this inanimate object's feelings. The humans behind it, we don't care so much about. That's perfect for my <laughs> plug. That's perfect for my plug. So Molly Schulman and I, she invited me to help her curate a show at Super Collider, which mm-hmm. is the one you saw. It was called Artifacts of Sentience, and that was thinking about the internet being the last generation of people. Who will parent who remember the world before the internet, presumably, unless really all hell breaks loose and we lose it. Um, Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I see where Javier is going. Uh, so um, we were really cognizant of this as the lockdown period began. And it's, it's because, you know, it was a conversation. I have a lot of, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a pretty, like, I see lots of different sides of things. So like, I don't, e- I don't even know, but I just, I feel, you know, there, there's a very significant and very powerful and very, very tiny group of people who control computer code and develop an artificial intelligence and are basically making our future and we're all going along with it. And it's a really small demographically select group of people. So um, there's, I don't think there's nearly enough attention paid or criticism of it. And we uh, we were just thinking about the internet and the effect on the culture and that, you know, as women, I don't think Molly was quite 40 yet. I was into my 40s already. Um, parenting and the kids have just access to the internet and instant information and all these things that were just really, really different than my mm-hmm. childhood. And we um, 
worked on creating a show of artists who were investigating different elements of our online culture. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, but it was tiny and it was during the pandemic. So we get to revisit it and expand it now. Yeah, at Monta Vista. At Monta Vista Projects in September. I voted for it, just so that you know. Ah, uh, thank you. I wasn't there trying to cock block. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, so yeah, we we have some great new artists, but we're also going to have some of the um, former artists on the roster. Uh, since we don't have everything quite finalized yet, I probably shouldn't just advertise. When's it up? Uh, it'll be September, um, September 10th. Yeah. But the... Um, but the ones that were in at the show before, um, So Young Shin, actually, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Serana Mayra, Brina Rasmussen, and um, Tai Tai um, will be uh, involved again. Okay. And that's really exciting. Every time now, now when uh, someone starts calling, doing call outs like that, and it's a uh, long list, I'm always nervous that I'm gonna have to cut it out because I'll forget the last name of somebody. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I mean, you no, can sometimes cut it, but I just want to call out the show because no, no, I'm no, excited no. about working You're on more it than again. No, no, and that we're doing it. Sometimes people are like, they start and they're so confident, and then at the end of it, they're like, "Oh, can you cut that out?" Because I forgot like six of them. <laughs> I didn't forget anybody, um, cool. but Ta but Tai Tai Ta Ta was going by Tina Wang before, so uh, I stumbled Ta -ta. over the name. Okay. <laughs> Oh no, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> okay, that's what I did, but I was like, um, yeah. So that it was like it was a small show, and we'll have this. People have agreed to be involved again, which is nice. But we'll also have new artists for it, and mm -hmm. um, and there's a tangibility to the works. So They're not like a, a slew of video or or um, virtual reality, or it's like a, not a slew of screens. It's mm -hmm. it's meant to be seen in person as sculptures and. Uh, so Young Shins was a tapestry, it's yeah. a crazy huge tapestry, um, and other physical objects. And I mean, I think that I think that the identity politics and all of these things, I, I mean, I actually think in th like these really, really, really super big picture things, I, we have to think about what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. If AI d develops a sentience, develops a consciousness, which is like, you know, a cyberpunk idea that's existed for a while, where will humans be? What will we be? And what are our physical bodies? And I think because the physical body gives us lots of pleasure, but it also gives us lots of pain. It mm -hmm. gives us so much trouble. It's part of why we're, I mean, people are very invested in their internet identities. Yeah. Because they can make them more beautiful, like the way that, you know, you Photoshop, I don't do this, but like people Photoshop a selfie or whatever with a face tune and all that. You could do all these things that you don't actually have in real life. And people get more and more invested in that. And I actually don't think it's healthy. I think I work in the internet and I I don't see the internet. I think the internet is an amazing communication device, an amazing organization device that can be really helpful. But the way that people have started to interact online, it, it seems to have a lot of ramifications that are not so healthy. So yeah, I find that I just it's fascinating. And I don't know what will happen. Well, I stopped. I had to change the way that I related to Instagram guess because because yeah. i was like especially when we were all locked down i was like pretending i had a social life <laughs> <laughs> on instagram and, yeah and then and then now that we're coming out of it i'm like actually interacting with people and and seeing uh -huh. them and i'm like oh yeah this is much better <laughs> <laughs> yeah right <laughs> but, i know and I, I like worry like i when facebook in early days i was like i'd feel bad about like posting a picture of myself doing something I'm like but uh, my other friends weren't here and then they'll yeah. feel bad and like that's you know these are real things yeah <laughs> so, no the, yeah. it's definitely there's definitely a lot to uh to talk about there the one thing i think is funny is that i i had um that you're talking about sentience and you're quote curating this show with molly and the first time that molly did the show was uh, a live episode that we did at cirrus and the topic was the the like boy the future doesn't need us. The, had, are you familiar with Bill Joy's article? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she was like, whatever. <laughs> I know that's actually kind of. I think she and I were debating it. Like I'm oh. afraid of it, and, and she's, she's like, like, nah, nah. And we were like talking about. It. That's how she invited me to get involved. Oh okay, that's funny. I was like, I want to start a salon. I don't know. I want the. I want to be involved in this conversation. I was. I, I had started out teaching a graduate seminar um and i was just thinking how like how i can continue because the conversation was so interesting there with the students yeah and uh but also when in my own reading it but I'm, i felt like i was just having the conversation with myself mostly <laughs> except for the seminar and um i wanted i wanted to do more with it then we kept talking about it and she invited me to work with her on the show well on that's the exhibition the, so it was really great you, she's you, amazing to work with she's so fun 
you can oh yeah she's, yeah, she's like amazing she's, she's my art mom i mean I, she's younger than me but <laughs> she's, she's, but she's, a, really she's a very person. nurturing person yeah uh, like look at made in la yeah yeah no yeah. i mean yeah this is well documented that this show came out of that, that <laughs> yeah that, um well that she and salome are like fuck the instant they're like fuck the power yeah, like yeah. anyone anyone yeah. can be involved no know? i did that's yeah. how i learned how i could just decide that i was important yeah. <laughs> right. or that i mattered not that i was important but yeah i like um nah i mean we can keep going i just it's we're at like two hours and seven minutes so oh, we should probably and you have wrap. to edit all that yeah we should definitely <laughs> wrap up like <laughs> but uh it's been lovely thank you and it's been lovely talking to you yeah yeah all right so bridget batch at bridget batch on instagram you yes. have a website bridgetbatch.com and uh I'm, i was earlier embarrassed that you looked at my old website i have to, i have to update it i'm too like Update it. Yeah, if I'm you're doing the show too, yeah, like yeah. getting your name out there. I've been doing this four years. I still haven't updated. My it. website is actually a better source of my work than Instagram because I, like I mentioned, I've had a bit of a, I hadn't brought anything quite to realization and practice, but now things are starting to come together again. Mm -hmm. And I, but so like that made me not want to post on Instagram, like not feeling that I was. Instagram that. made me not want to post on Instagram. Yeah. Like the professionalization of Instagram is pretty intense. Instagram sucks. No. Yeah. I want to by the same. It's Facebook. You know? Yeah. yeah it's it's the same stuff. I can't wait till they buy something else and make it awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. All right. Yeah. Okay. We got to wrap it up. <laughs> and thank you so much for watching. Uh, and thank you we'll for be, we'll everything. We'll be back. We'll be back with uh, another guest next week with another interesting topic. Thank you very much for having me, Javier. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Letting me discourse. <laughs> <laughs> and, thank you for um, tolerating my political opinions. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, I'm far too political myself. Obviously. <laughs> I know. I, I we smell each other. <laughs> oh, we can talk about this.